Welcome to Bethany Community Church. My name is Emily and here's what you need to know. If you're engaged to be married, congratulations. You can build a strong foundation for your marriage even before it begins. And one way to do so is through the engagement class, which starts up again at the end of March. Register online. Details can be found in your bulletin. There are lots of safe ways to serve both our church community and our neighborhood in this season. Some of these opportunities include preparing breakfast for our unhoused neighbors, donating blood at our next Red Cross blood drive, and serving at the Duwamish Longhouse in a few weeks. More details about these and more opportunities can be found in your bulletin and online. Thanks for worshiping with us today. If you have any questions throughout the week or are looking for more resources, be sure to engage with us on social media or email our staff at any time. Let's worship together. Well, welcome everyone. We join in worship together. darkness tries to roll over my bones when sorrow comes to steal the joy I own when brokenness and pain is all I know I won't be shaken no I won't be shaken sing my fear my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Shame no longer. to the lies I'm not afraid to leave my past behind I won't be shaken no I won't be shaken cause my fear doesn't stand
to us and we we just want to agree with you today about about who you are and what you've done who you say we are uh, Jesus we're so grateful to be uh, your children today uh, draw us close draw us into you draw us into your family into your kingdom Lord uh, for your glory amen well as we continue in worship we're so excited that there are many many folks who have been drawn in during this last year and are going to join us as a church in membership today. So we're going to join Pastor Megan and these folks. We'll be encouraged about the ways that God is bringing people to our community. So let's continue in worship. Hello. Today we are adding some new members to the Bethany family in our surprisingly ongoing COVID edition of membership. These folks have a variety of stories and experiences, some of whom have only been at Bethany in person a couple months before the pandemic started, and now they've been largely online, some of whom have been for years and years and years. Membership here at Bethany is different than almost any other membership you might hold or have. It's a mutual relationship centered around committing yourself to this community, acknowledging that for the time that you're here, you're going to invest in your community and equally let your community invest in you. Hebrews 10 23 encourages us to spur one another on toward love and good deeds to keep meeting together, which right now takes this kind of form. 
And membership is this sense of belonging to one another, being devoted to both our own spiritual growth and to that of the community. One of Bethany's greatest strengths is the variety of gifts, perspectives, and expressions of faith that our community holds. I think that these differences make us stronger and a more full reflection of Christ, uh, communally more fully reflecting him than any of us could be on our own. So this is the type of relationship and belonging that these folks are committing to today. So there's a bunch of them. I'd love to introduce them to you. So if you could tell us your name and why membership, why now? Hi, thank you, Megan. My name is Vanessa Merlini, and um, I've been coming to Bethany since about 2014 and membership now um, because Bethany has continued to show up and, um, and see me and meet me where I'm at and uh, teach me. And um, the relationships I have formed have been, uh, have changed my life. So um, now, because it's actually easier in COVID, <laughs> because I don't have to get childcare. <laughs> Think, and that's why. Uh, thank you. Hey, I'm Mark, and this is Esther. And uh, we have been going to Bethany for over 10 years. And, um, you know, we've been part of this community for so long already, and it was really important for us to be able to kind of declare our commitment to Bethany Community Church together and kind of do it publicly, similar to baptisms or weddings. And we just wanted to be able to say that out loud um, to our great Bethany community. So we're really excited. Hey, my name is Victor Lee. Uh, I've been going to Bethany for almost uh, six years or so. And uh, choosing membership now because I finally felt like I've been putting down roots in the uh, greater Seattle area. And that means getting a home church and Bethany has been uh, really awesome to me. So I felt like it's timely, finally time to plant down the flag of a home church. Hi, my name is Pat O'Dell. My daughter has been a member for a long time. She's been in Stephen ministry. She's been on mission trips. And um, I, in the last couple of years, I have, haven't had a church and I've been doing a lot of studying about my faith and theology really matters a lot to me. And um, everything that I hear from Bethany, I believe in and I love. Um, I have a lot more to learn, and um, the main thing is uh, learning about being conformed to the image of Christ, and I feel that cannot be done outside a community, and so I want to, uh, I want to come to Bethany for a place to grow and a place to serve, and they give those so many opportunities there, so I'm excited. <laughs> Hey everyone, I'm Amanda and this is my husband, Nick. We've been going to Bethany for over two years now. We've mainly plugged in through the small group ministry and as we've had a growing sense of community within the church, we wanted to take the next step and become members. Hi, I'm Daniel and this is Brittany. And I've been back here on uh, I felt a really strict and commitment to Bethany, but kind of a crazy work schedule. Every time the membership was on my radar, I had to work during that time. Um, but COVID kind of helped me to slow my life down and gave me a lot of um, time to reflect. And it really felt like God was kind of pushing me a little bit to become a member. So that's why I did it. And I wanted to do it with him at the same time. I thought that was really special and important that we could do it at the same time. And Bethany has meant a lot to me in the last five years that I've attended. And it's nice to be able to make this commitment now. Hi, uh, I'm Travis. This is my wife, Ashley, uh, and this is our daughter, Emerson. Um, we've been going to Bethany uh, a little over four years now. 
Um, and we'd always had in the back of our mind, you know, after a year or two, it became pretty clear that we, uh, you know, we loved Bethany and we wanted to be um, a stronger part of it. Um, and then Amy came along. Uh, we have pandemic baby. Uh, <laughs> and that was our, our extra impetus. You know, we want to make sure she has a, a strong church, church home to grow up in. Um, so, yeah, that's why we're becoming members. Hi, my name is Shauna, and I want to become a member with Bethany now, mostly just because I want to officially start calling Bethany my home church. Okay, I'm Ann McFarland. I'm Jim McFarland. <laughs> and we've uh, lived in Florida for almost 40 years, but we've been visiting Bethany since 96, about once a year, to come see our grandchildren here. Our son, Ben, um, McFarland um, was here and we came to see him and then his brother John, our son John came. We have eight grandchildren here and uh, we just love uh, worshiping at Bethany Investing and we're excited to, we missed the first membership class. We've only lived here about a year, a little over a year and um, so we're excited to jump on now. You know, right now after um, 20 years visiting and a year and a half being actually here in Seattle. Hi, we're uh, Keith and Amanda Naruzzo, and uh, we've been going to Bethany for a little over a year and a half. And and for me, it's it really feels like the place that I belong at this time in my life. And you know, I really enjoy the the praise music and the advanced teaching that we have at Bethany. And I like to be challenged by the message and all of the pastors leave me feeling challenged at the end of the day. Um, we also like ways to get involved. And so we've been involved in some of the ministries and it's just, uh, for me, it's a start time to commit to, to, to Bethany. Yeah, and I agree. I um, feel like it's good for me to make a kind of a public declaration of my commitment to Bethany and to God and how, um, a stronger base um, so that I'm more available to serve and Bethany can find me and um, let me know if I'm needed and uh, rather than kind of floating around in and out um, really be strongly based in in Bethany and um, and grow. Well we are uh, John Wayne and Leanna Seitzler. John Wayne's got some information. Yeah I think during COVID kind of the the norm of the culture is to maybe disengage and step back a little bit, but I think we just kind of want to be faithful to the way of Christ and commit to this body now and um, yeah, just start the the engagement process, even if it is virtual to to begin with that foot forward. And we are Katie and Michael Gieske. Yeah. And we started this journey a year and a half ago, um, and then we had a couple of things get in the way from baptism to COVID. And so we're just really excited to commit ourselves uh, to this church and be a part of the community, whatever that looks like in the coming year. Well, thank you all for sharing. I know there's way more behind each of those uh, things that you shared. So hopefully in uh, coming years and months and days, we'll be able to hear more of your story. Uh, since this is a community endeavor, our new members will take a covenant pledge, but then I'll ask you, our community, to commit to these folks as you're able. So new members, have you committed your life to Christ? If so, say yes. 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 Are you committed to ongoing transfer transformation and becoming more and more like him? Yes. 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 Are you committed to this community? Yes to hold us accountable and allowing us to hold you accountable. Yes. yes. Will you commit to not being divisive and to serving this community? Yes. 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 Great. Now to you, the congregation, I get that this is a little bit strange, but we can just hold in our hearts and hands that God is outside of time and space. But will you, do you receive these new members and will you commit to praying and coming alongside them in good seasons and in hard ones as you have the opportunity? If so, please say yes. 
Oh my gosh, I heard it all. Did you? My heart stirred a little bit. So please join me in prayer for these new members. Lord God, we thank you so much for these folks, these folks who have faithfully and creative, creatively pursued you in the midst of this unusual season and in the midst of their time here. Lord, I know that Bethany is a stronger, better church for their uh, attendance and participation and for their perspective. Lord, I pray that you would cross our paths uh, in many ways, virtual and real, so as to encourage each other to really see and lift each other on uh, and to challenge each other in relationship and in our uh, walk and, and time here on earth. Lord, I, I pray that uh, we would all uh, use the gifts that you have given us in wild and flourishing ways for the goodness of your kingdom. In your name, amen. So though you saw these people virtually, if you know any of them, maybe you could send them a text or an email that says, welcome to Bethany, and just let them know that you saw them here today. Mm -hmm. Well, again, welcome new members. Usually that's spread out across four services. So you got to see everybody this, this year, this time. So excited for that. And thank you for those of you who committed to supporting them in their membership. Just really grateful for that. As we turn to our giving moment, uh, there are lots of ways to give. People gave examples in the membership uh, moment, but there's also ways to give monetarily there online. Please join me in prayer. Lord God, I thank you so much for offering us ways to belong in this really strange season, that your creativity is ever more expansive and inclusive to showing us how we can be in community and pursue you together. Lord, I pray that you would continue to expand that, continue to expand our ways to give uh, both of our time and of our money in ways that glorify you and bring us closer and closer to you and each other. In your name, amen.
Jesus, my captain, my soul's trusted. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Caitlin Pritchard, and I'm the Associate Director of Early Childhood Ministries here at Bethany Green Lake. And I'm here with some friends of mine, and I want to ask them a question. So my question for you guys, if you guys want to wave, you can. <laughs> my question for you guys is, have you ever had a big party to celebrate a special holiday or something, a special event? So if you have, tell me about it. So let's see. Marcel, can you tell me about what you have, your special event? My birthday, it was fun because, 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 because I, because, because Lego people were on the cake. And, and Oh, my goodness. And my cousins, Liam and Claire, and Grandma and Captain were there. And it was pretty fun. And how old did you turn on your birthday? Okay, well, I turned seven. <gasps> seven this many. That is so cool, Marcel. Thanks for sharing. What about Maxine? Do you want to share? On my birthday is in May. In May 2nd. Yeah, Mar May 2nd. That's <laughs> exciting. Are you going to have a big party then? But it's going to be with a frozen cake. A frozen cake. That sounds incredible. I love it. Frozen. Yes, I love Frozen. It's one of my favorite movies. All right. Ryan, what about you? I went to my friend's party, and there was some cake and some pizza. And there was lots of Legos, and I hit a pinata, and there was lots of candy inside. <gasps> candy, I love candy. Do you have a favorite candy, Ryan? Um, I like peanut butter cups. <gasps> peanut butter cups are delicious. Well, this question is kind of something that reminds me of a Bible story that we're going to talk about today. In our Zoom Kids Connect, which happened at 9 and 10, you can get the link from the online host. But today we're going to talk about a story where Jesus went to a party. Uh, the party that Jesus went to were, was called Passover, and that's a celebration of when the Israelites got to leave Egypt because God helped save them. So Jesus went to this party in the temple, and what he saw happening there was something that was not part of God's plan. People were selling things and kind of doing stuff that shouldn't happen in a temple or a holy place like God intended. So Jesus got very upset. And Jesus got so upset that things that were not happening, that were not happening uh, or were not part of God's plan, he got so upset that those were happening that he flipped a table over and then... Yeah, yeah, exactly. The table went bye-bye. <laughs> and Jesus told everyone to leave the temple, and they asked him, on whose authority do you have to say that we have to leave the temple? And that's when Jesus said, "In three, I will destroy this temple, and then in three days build it up again. And that confused everyone, because the temple was this huge building, and it was so big, it took years to build. So they were like, you can't rebuild it in three days. But Jesus had been talking about his body and how he would be, dis how he would die and then be rose risen again in three days. So they didn't get that at first. But then after it happened, after everything went to God's plan, they understood what Jesus said. And it's kind of like God had this plan all along for Jesus and God has plans for us too. Did you know that God has a plan for you and you and you and all of us? So I want us to remember that. It's really important. And we're going to talk about it more, like I said, on our Kids Connect and then also in our Family Faith Packet. But in the meantime, I'd love to have us pray, right? So can everybody join me? Fold your hands in prayer. 
We're going to say, dear God, thank you so much for all of our friends that are here today. Thank you for giving us your plans and giving us um, your son, Jesus, who came and died for us um, and loves us very much. And thank you uh, that you have plans for each of us. And I just pray that you would bless us and help us to follow them. In your name, amen. Okay, can we wave bye? No. Bye bye. 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 <laughs>
the guy is speaking to ministry leaders. There's about 200 of us in the room. And he says this. He says, some of you are really excited about your ministries. Some are seeing amazing provision. Some are super energized. Some are hopeful. Some are filled with sorrow. Some have had difficult experiences. And then this is, he just said it as one of uh, many things in a list of heart conditions in a way. He said, and some of you are tired. In fact, you're more than tired, you're exhausted because you've been going and going and going and pushing and pushing and pushing. And you don't know if you can go another day. And I remember tears coming down my face, realizing that that's exactly the state of my heart. And I had never paused even long enough to consider how tired I was. I was just going and going and going. And then he spoke about Sabbath, actually. And that sermon changed my view of Sabbath and ultimately changed my life profoundly, as I'll share toward the end. This text is about Sabbath, as Megan read. And I want to suggest to you that in this season, that is a very difficult season because of COVID and politics and economics and race, and if you live in Seattle, this huge wealth gap that makes hardworking people uh, uh, find themselves in a situation where they can't afford to buy a house. Uh, lots of challenges, lots of difficulties. If we are to live in this season and know peace and, and live into the calling that God has for us, there are three laws that are in this text that we need to embrace. And laws, uh, as God reveals laws, are not like speed laws or don't break into somebody's house laws. Laws in God's economy are this. Look, this is the way the world works. I made the world. I'm telling you, this is the way the world works. And if you align yourself with the way that the world works, things will go better for you. But if you don't align yourself with the way the world works, things won't go very well. And there are three laws that I want to look at this morning together. Let me give these to you at the outset, and then we'll look at each of them. There's the law of provision, the law of rhythm, and the law of deep rest. We must embrace each of these laws if we're to live the life that God has created us to live. And so let's look at these together, beginning with the law of provision, which is found in verse 15 of Exodus 16. I'll just uh, read it for you here. Uh, when the sons of Israel saw it, it being this manna, this bread that shows up on the ground every morning, because if you'll recall, in their journey to, uh, through, the, through the wilderness, they find themselves facing hunger, as we saw last week. Now we read that God's provision for this hunger was in one moment quail, but in an ongoing uh, pattern, God was providing bread called manna that showed up every morning. And so verse 15 says this, it came about in the morning when the sons of Israel saw it, they said to one another, what is it? And they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, it's the bread which the Lord has given you to eat. This is the law of provision. Let me explain what I mean by that. What is it, they asked. Moses answered, it's the bread the Lord has given you to eat. And the key word here is this, given. The word Lord in the Bible uh, is, uh, if you see it in all caps in the Old Testament, it's, it's this name of God, Yahweh or Jehovah, which really means a covenant keeper. When God shows up for Abraham in Genesis 28, excuse me, for Jacob in Genesis 28, and Jacob has lied and cheated and stolen and his brother wants to kill him and he's on the run, God shows up and God says to a man not worthy of anything other than judgment, I will for you. I will keep you. I will protect you. I will guide you. I will lead you. I will give. I will give and give and give. Not because you're worthy, because that is my nature. I will give. And this bread is given to people who just moments earlier had said, God brought us out into the wilderness to kill us. We don't trust God. We doubt God. We're not even sure if we believe God. And God's like this, I don't care. I will give. It falls to you then and me to learn to receive, right? Now, this text is about bread that shows up on the ground in the desert, but since Jesus declares himself in John 6 to be the bread of life and contrasts his life with the manna that we see here in that Jesus says, I am eternal satisfaction. This bread you needed to get daily. Jesus is declaring 
that I am the one who I will give you. I will give and give and give everything you need. And by everything, here's what I mean, everything. Every breath is a gift. Every sip of clean water is a gift. Every bite of food is a gift. Your shelter is a gift. Your friendships are a gift. Forgiveness is a gift. Freedom from the addiction into which you've fallen is a gift. Healing is a gift. Intimacy is a gift. Your, 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 your vocation is a gift. Joy is a gift. Love is a gift. Peace is a gift. Patience is a gift. Without the giving nature of God, life is nothing other than a struggle and you die, but with the giving nature of God, this is what I say to people, every day is Christmas. And God is giving gifts. It falls to us to learn to receive. Now, let me make a couple of very important applications here so that we can learn to receive as children. Application number one, God as a giver and us as receivers is a paradigm that flies completely in the face of all consumerism. My email inbox gets very messy because of all the invitations that are in my inbox to make my life happier or more secure or more productive or more adventurous or healthier or longer if I will simply acquire this product or take this class or indulge in this experience. I have opportunities to go ski touring. I have opportunities to buy beet juice so that my blood pressure will go down. I, I have uh, opportunities to take a class on meditation. I have opportunities to get a, a, a smart ball for my dog that I can operate with an app so that when my, ball, uh, when my dog uh, goes after the ball, I can make the ball move. And if my, ball gets, uh, my, if my dog gets bored, I can make the ball come to him. It's all there in my inbox, stuff waiting for me to acquire so that my life will be better. And all of this is based on this paradigm. Acquire what you need in order to make your life better. And I want to suggest to you that that sentence is wrong at every level. And so let me just unpack this for a minute, okay? Acquire what you need in order to make your life better. That's how many of us live our lives and when we're living our lives that way, we are living our lives at our worst, not our best. Why do I say that? Because in this text, God reminds us, look, life is not about acquiring, life is about receiving. I need to learn that what I need in life is not another product or experience. What I need is contentment with what God gives me. First Timothy chapter 6 speaks of the danger of unrestricted greed. And Timothy, uh, Paul's letter to Timothy, Paul goes on to say to Timothy, listen, if you have food and shelter, be content. In other words, what do you really need uh, to, to, to find contentment in life? You need what God has given to you. So we need to learn contentment in order that we might be freed from the notion that a better life is out there waiting for you somewhere in the future after the next degree, after the next job after the next workout of the day, after the next sexual encounter, after the lower body mass index, after the bigger TV, after the next va vacation. And I'm here to say to you, we who are upwardly mobile, stuck in this pattern of acquisition, no. I mean, there are people in poverty working two jobs, three jobs, no Sabbath, to put food on the table, and then there's a bunch of us who have way more than we need, and we who are in this paradigm of having more than we need are stuck often in a pattern thinking that acquisition will be our peace. It won't. So acquire what you need in order to make your life better? No. Begin to develop this, this childlike posture of receiving and being content with what you have. Second, in this uh, same sentence, there's this sense Acquire what you need in order to make your life better? No. You don't make your life. You're not the architect of your life. You're actually on a journey of discovery to allow the gifts that God has already put in you to flourish and mature into a calling. So, so we don't acquire, we receive. We don't make a life, we discover a life. And if we are receiving and discovering, there can be rest. But if we're acquiring and making, there will be anxiety, 
and stress, and ultimately, uh, we're going to burn out in some kind of way. Uh, still under this principle, the law of provision, we need to look at verses 16 to 18. Uh, listen as I read. What we see here is uh, this bread shows up, and then uh, Moses says this. This is what the Lord has commanded. Gather of it every man as much as he should eat. Take an omar apiece according to the number of persons you have in your tent. So the sons of Israel did so. Some gathered, as, um, uh, some gathered much, some gathered little. And when they gathered, the one who gathered much had no excess. The one who gathered little had no lack. Everyone as much as he needed. Uh, here we see that God provides for us, but we can't be passive in our receiving of what God gives. Uh, in God's design, we receive, but we don't receive passively. We have a role to play. In this case, they need to get up in the morning and go out and gather the manna. The manna didn't come into their tent and show up while they were there laying in their tent. They had to get up, actually before the sun got too high in the sky, and go out and gather the manna. So God is the giver. We receive, but we don't receive passively. We have a role to play. And, and, and so there are a couple of simple uh, observations that I want to make from these verses. God provides, they need to gather. The fact that God provides prevents arrogance. We don't, we don't uh, without God, acquire anything. Everything that is in our lives, we, we enjoy because God is the giver. So we, there's no arrogance. I didn't build anything by myself. I don't sustain my life. I don't create my own joy and wisdom and peace and patience. So we're freed from arrogance, but... Also, we're freed from passivity because God has always given us a role to play. We have to get up out of our sleeping bag, out of our tent, go out and get the, get the manna. So the question in our lives that should lead to this sense of contentment and peace should be this simple question, God, what are you giving me today? What, what, what am I receiving from you? And I'm receiving food, and I'm receiving shelter, and I'm receiving companionship and I'm receiving the measure of health that I enjoy. And God, now what steps do you want me to take in order to use that which you've given me uh, to fulfill the calling that you have for me? Like God has given me gifts, but I have a role to play in allowing those gifts to flourish. If God has given me a gift of teaching and writing, then I need God for revelation, but I also have to show up. One of my favorite books is the War of Art by Stephen Pressfield. It's written for people who are writers, and I'm a writer. And one of my favorite quotes in that book is someone had asked Pressfield, um, do you only write when inspiration strikes? And he said, well, yeah, but thankfully, inspiration strikes every morning at 9 a.m., and so I need to be at my desk every morning at 9 a.m., so that when the inspiration strikes, I can receive it. Now, I don't know if he's, a, if he's a Christ follower or not, but that's very wise. I must show up to receive what God wants to give. My wife has recently come through a season of uh, illness with a bout of vertigo. The affliction she had is called vestibular neuritis. In the providence of God, we were able to get into a physical therapist. Uh, soon after she was stricken, the physical therapist says this. This is amazing to me. She says, the bad news is this. The virus destroyed the neural pathway between your brain and the inner ear so that you, th there's no balance because you're getting a different signal from your left ear than your right ear. And so just uh, when, she, when she was first stricken with this on Christmas Eve, she could not walk down the hallway without missing the door. It was unbelievable. But then she says, here's the good news. The way your body is designed, your body will rebuild the neural pathway. If, she says, if you do the physical therapy, but you have to do the physical therapy. It's a perfect illustration to me of this notion of receiving and, and acting. Does that make sense? Receiving. Yes, God has made me brilliantly so that my brain will build a new per, uh, neural pathway, but not if I stay in bed. I have to get up, and I have to, if in, my, in my wife's case, she needed to walk down the hall, and, and at the beginning, it's just a matter of walking down the hall. And then it's, 
you know, walking down the hall and lifting this leg. And then three more steps and this leg. And then it's looking this way. And then it's looking this way. And then it's throwing a ball behind her, her, her back, receiving it from me, me handing it to her, throwing it with her other hand. And then it's a matter of her walking backwards while I throw a ball to her. She catches the ball better now than she did before she was sick. So uh, God has made us in this remarkable way and God is providing, but we must show up, and many aren't. We're wasting our lives on Netflix with reruns, with social media. It's upsetting us. It's giving us neurosis, anger, fear, anxiety. All the while, God is saying, look, I've given you gifts. I've given you a calling. Use your gifts. That's this text. And if I show up and receive what God has given, it's the death blow to both pride and despair. There's no pride because I can't do it without the gifts that God has already given. But there's no despair because God has given and now it, it falls to me to fan into flame what God has given. And that's, that's all of us in the room. That's the law of provision. God's given you everything you need to live the life for which you're created. Second, there's a law of rhythm. Let me read verses 21 through 23 of this text. Morning by morning, they gathered manna, each as much as he could eat, but when the sun grew hot, it melted. On the sixth day, they gathered twice as much bread. And when the leaders of the congregation came and told Moses, Moses said, here's why. Uh, tomorrow, the seventh day, is a day of solemn rest, a, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what you will bake, Boil what you will boil. All that is left over, lay aside to be kept till morning. Gather twice as much on day six, because on day seven, there won't be any. Now, what God is creating here is one of many rhythms for humans that you find in the scriptures. Many rhythms. So there's a law of rhythm. Let me explain what I mean by this. Mark Boyle, an Irishman, uh, wrote a book that I read last year entitled The Way Home, subtitle, A Year of Living Without Power. This guy spent an entire year uh, living without any electricity, no gas-powered engines. He spent a year living without power. He writes about it. And one of the things that stands out to me most profoundly in The Way Home is uh, his musings on what he learned, and he wrote it all, by the way, by pencil, on a, note, on a notepad, the whole book, because, of course, no power. Uh, one, one of the most profound things that I received from the book was this sense of the rhythm that came to him from the sunrise and sunset. Ireland's pretty far north, so the days are long in the summer, really short in the wintertime. And he, he said this. He said, well, as my body began to align with circadian rhythm, Everything changed for me. I found myself more present in conversations. My pulse uh, was slower. I found it easier to rest. I slept better. Everything was better when I aligned with the rhythms of the universe. That's a good word. Listen to Psalm 104, beginning of verse 19. God made the moon to mark the seasons, and the sun knows when to go down. You, God, bring darkness, it becomes night. During the night, many of the beasts of the forest prowl. The lions roar for their prey, seek food from God. The sun rises, the beasts steal away. They return, they lie down in their tents. And meanwhile, the people go out and do their work, and they labor until evening. Here's the people. The sun comes up, they get out, they go, they do their work. They come home in the evening, the sun goes down, they go to bed while they're sleeping. The animals get up, they go out, they do their thing, they go to bed, the sun comes up, we, we go out again, over and over and over again. I love this phrase. The people do their work until evening. It's indicative of God's design. Of course, it's not true anymore because the call to evening rest has been disrupted in our bodies by the endless light that is our Western world. And as a result, we've lost circadian rhythm, our cortisol levels are up, our insulin levels are up, our sleep levels are down. Uh, anxiety is rooted in this. Some anxiety is rooted in this. We conquered the night, but, but, we, but we lost. 
And the theme here is this. God provides rhythms, lots of different rhythms, day and night, fasting and feasting, morning and rejoicing, time to speak, time to be uh, silent. This is Ecclesiastes 3. For everything, there's a time. For everything, there's a season. And one of the rhythms that seems uniquely given to humans among all uh, the, 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 the created order is this notion of the Sabbath. Six days of work, one day of rest. Studies show that those who practice the Sabbath have reduced cortisol levels, reduced stress levels, reduced anxiety levels, better sleep, strengthened immune system, fewer days of illness, more productivity, better intimate relationships, reduced risk of heart disease, increased creativity. We're made for this rhythm. Work, 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 rest. Repeat. We're made for it. And by the way, this too is the only command in the Bible, in the Ten Commandments, is the only one that also applies to the animals. God doesn't say, honor your father and mother and make sure that uh, all your beasts honor their parents as well. But God does say regarding the Sabbath, six days you'll work, one day you'll rest. You, your workers, the, 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 the sojourners who are staying with you, and your animals, everybody rests one day. So God is providing this rhythm. Verse 26, six days gather, on the seventh day, the Sabbath, there won't be anything on the ground. And then verse 27, this is what you read. On the seventh day, some people went out to gather, and there was nothing on the ground. And then God said to Moses, how long will these people refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? You can, you can he kind of hear the frustration in God's voice. This is the way the world works. You're made for this. Work, 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 rest. Sun up, get up. Sun down, go down. You're made for this, but you fight against it. Why? It's for the best. Why do we conquer the night only to lose sleep? Why do we conquer the Sabbath only to lose peace and, and space to receive and reflect and, re uh, and restore? Why do we conquer day-by-day -day dependency on Christ only to lose childlike uh, faith. And the, I think the answer is this. We don't want rhythm. We want, a, like, like, a, uh, we kind of want this static life, basically. We prefer security to rhythm. We prefer to arrive rather than live in this posture of continual dependency. We are trying to get to a place in our lives where we're in total control, where we don't need to submit to the rhythms of God. And, in our vision for the good life, there's no waiting, it's just gratification. There's no dependency, it's independence. There, there, there's, no, there's no want, there's just satisfaction. There's, there's no rest, there's just action and productivity and pleasure. There's, there's no Sabbath where, where we stop and receive from God, there's just more doing. The point is this, we wanna to get to a point in our lives where we don't need to depend on the rhythms of God. As someone approaching retirement someday, I can tell you that our culture is built around all of us trying to become like the guy in Luke 12 who has a few bumper crops, so he builds bigger and bigger barns, and finally he comes to a point of saying this, Don, man, I have plenty of grain laid up for many years. I don't need to depend on God anymore. God calls him a fool. He says, you've spent your life trying to get to a point where you don't need to receive anymore. And in so doing, you have utterly missed the point. Because what does it profit a person to gain the whole world, but lose their soul? We are made for a life with boundaries, and the boundaries are determined by rhythm. Wake, sleep. Day, night. Work, Rest, receive, give, inhale, exhale, hungry, full, rejoice, lament, forgive, confront. Rhythm, the rhythm creates boundaries and the fool spends his life trying to overcome boundaries. And the reason that Jesus calls this man a fool is he says, look, I've given you the boundaries so that you can experience all that I want to give you in life, but you only want half the equation. 
You want the waking and the day and the receiving and the, and, and, and the producing and the being full and the rejoicing. No. My work ethic when I heard that sermon in 1993 was born out of insecurity, completely born out of insecurity. My wife and I had begun a ministry uh, up in the mountains, and uh, we were dependent on gifts from people and rental income from cabins that we'd bought, and I was officiating basketball games almost every night and teaching a little bit at various Bible schools. And anytime somebody wanted to come and stay uh, at our retreat center, we would offer a weekend for the guests, even if we'd been working for three weeks in a row. Because I was so afraid that if I didn't say yes to everything, God wouldn't provide for me and my young family. But my work ethic was born out of insecurity, if you can see that. And that led to me being on a plane, getting the flu, having a big argument with my wife in Hyde Park, and, and coming to a point of receiving a word regarding the Sabbath, which brings me to the third and last law, the law of deep rest. Because here's the thing. You could live uh, by candles and not use any electric lights at night and religiously cease from normal work one day a week and still miss the central point of all of this. In fact, the religious leaders of Jesus' day had these thick arguments about what rest meant. Oh, yeah, we want to keep the Sabbath. So let's decide. How far can you walk on the Sabbath? 300 yards? 100 yards? 500 yards? What constitutes work? How much weight can you lift? By the way, you couldn't lift more than two dried figs without it being constituting uh, work. So this teacup, violation of Sabbath. Too heavy. Can you put in your false teeth on the Sabbath? Can you light a fire on the Sabbath? Do you see how a gift given uh, by God to humanity was like totally perverted in our legalistic mindset and missing the deep point? Because the deep point is this, Hebrews chapter three and four, we see an articulation that the day of the Sabbath is intended to picture for us this invitation to live a life where the rest of God, R-E-S-T, the rest of God is our perpetual experience. In other words, real rest, it says in Hebrews 4, is this. We, in our humanity, are ceasing from our own work so that we can say with Paul in Galatians 5, I've been crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. I, yes, I live. But the life I live, I now live recognizing that there's one within me who empowers me, who provides for me, who guides me, who directs me. It's not my joy, it's his. It's not my peace, it's, it's Christ's. It's not my wisdom when I'm at a crossroads, it's Christ's. It's not my patience when I want to hit you, it's Christ's. Christ will be in and through me what I cannot be on my own if I will receive it. That's Sabbath. And we've missed it to be blunt. So we're told in Hebrews 4, look, make sure if you, if you miss nothing else, like understand the one thing that you're made for is this rest that is true Sabbath. The day of rest points to the deeper rest. My entire life is lived with empty hands. Christ, what do you have for me today? I'm gonna receive it. And I'm going to allow you to express your life through me, and I'm going to live it, and therein is rest. Because when I'm there, I'm trusting God to provide for me in every single way. I came home from uh, England, and quite soon after, I stopped officiating basketball games. And then we, we, we stopped doing some other outside work. And uh, soon, we were at a point where we were learning slowly, slowly, to trust God for provision. And the byproduct of that trust, rest. All of us are called to rest. Many of us are afraid, afraid for the future, afraid we won't have enough. I'm here to tell you the glad news this morning 
God says this, all that you need, think what you need right now. Wisdom, peace, material provision, guidance, all that you need. Here's God, Exodus chapter 16. I have given, receive. Father, teach us to live with empty hands that we might receive all that you have for us. And we'll thank you as we pray in Christ's name. As uh, our worship team comes up, I just encourage you to worship this morning, if you would, with empty hands. Open your hands and allow God to fill you with all that God wants to give so that you can live as a person of rest. Let's worship together. Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from, oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life, oh, he is my song.
Bible is actually filled with commands to fear not over 300 times, nearly 400 times actually. Fear not, fear not, fear not. And then there's this one verse. Therefore, let us fear. Fear what? Let us fear. If while a promise remains of entering God's rest, any of us would fall short of achieving it. For indeed, we have good news given to us and we who believe will enter rest. May you know rest this day, this week, this month. May you know the rhythm of God. May you know the matchless, infinite love of God the Father, our provider, the comfort of the Holy Spirit, and the indwelling presence of the resurrected Jesus. Go in rest in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We'll see you next time.